Good evening. I'm Lisa Hostetler, McAvoy Family Curator for Photography at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And I'm pleased to welcome you to tonight's installment of the Clarice Smith Lecture Series. Uh, before I introduce tonight's speaker, I just want to take a moment to say thank you to Clarice Smith, um, who is here tonight. Um, and a note of congratulations, you may know she's an accomplished painter, but she's having an exhibition at the New York Historical Society that opens next Friday, so congratulations. Um, now I'd like to introduce tonight's distinguished speaker, Richard Lakeo. He is an art critic and editor at large of Time, for whom he writes about art, architecture, and photography, as well as other topics across the spectrum of culture. He also maintains a daily blog about art and architecture on time.com called Looking Around. During the past few years, Lakeo has profiled the artists David Hockney, Richard Serra, Olafur Eliasson, and Martin Purrier, as well as the architects Frank Gehry, Norman Foster, Daniel Liebskind, and Diller and Scafidio. He covered the 2007 Venice Biennale and has reviewed dozens of museum shows throughout the US, Canada, and in Britain. Lakeo joined Time in 1984. He became Time's photography critic in 1986 and its art critic in 2003. Prior to 2003, he also covered law, social issues, and politics, and produced numerous cover stories on topics such as abortion, crime, gun control, privacy rights, and the presidential campaigns in 1992, 1996, and 2000. He wrote extensively about the Kenneth Starr investigation of President Bill Clinton and Clinton's subsequent impeachment. In 2004, the New York City chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists awarded him its Deadline Club Prize for arts writing for his piece, Bad Boy of the School of Paris, about the artist Amadeo Modigliani. He is also the co-author with George Russell of Eyewitness, 150 Years of Photojournalism. Lakeo holds a BA in English Literature from Cornell University and an MS from Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism, where he studied as a Scripps Howard Fellow. In 1999, he was also a Fellow at the Frank Institute for the Humanities at the University of Chicago. Please join me in welcoming Richard Lakeo. Good evening. And thank you. Uh, I would only add one note to what I, we just said. I don't do the blog any longer. I discontinued it about a year and a half ago because it was too much work. <laughs> um, everything else you said was correct. Um, I'd like to also begin by thanking the benefactors of tonight's uh, event, uh, Cleary Smith, who's made this entire series possible and who is here tonight, as we said. Um, Elizabeth Brown, the director of the Smithsonian, the trustees of the Smithsonian, and of course, the staff and curators as well. Um, as you know, I've come here tonight to talk about some of the many artists who worked into old, into old age, um, and I'm now going to learn how to do that. Um, how their art changed as they entered that period of life, how they used those years to distill and intensify certain aspects of their art, and how they also used it as an opportunity to come to terms with mortality and end of life issues and to report to us about what they had learned. Uh, the title of my talk tonight, Hurry Up, Please, It's Time, as many of you will recognize, is drawn from The Wasteland, the T.S. Eliot poem. There it's in a section where two women are talking while a classic British uh, pub owner is warning everyone that it's time to drink up. Uh, but in the context of that poem, it's always seemed to me that his words have the deeper resonance, almost the voice of God telling us all to remember to hurry up, please, it's time. And closing time seems to have a meaning that goes beyond the pub. Um, early in the 20th century, uh, German art historians began to formulate an idea that they called the altar steel, the old age style. Now, a hundred years later, there's still very little agreement as to what characterizes that style and how broadly those characteristics can be applied. In 1970, the great British art historian Sir Kenneth Clark delivered a lecture on this very topic in which he concluded that one thread that connected the, art, the late life style of many artists was what he called a transcendent pessimism a very poor view of human life. Um, ooh. 
And while I would say that that's probably a valid way of talking about some of the late work of Michelangelo, uh, the late work of Titian, whom we'll talk about a lot tonight, uh, certainly the late work of Goya, it doesn't really help you to come to grips with the incandescent late canvases of J.M.W. Turner or of Hopper, however mordant they could also be, uh, much less of Matisse in the almost ecstatic cut paper work of his later life, like this piece, The Clown from 1943, which would have been when Matisse was 73, and a work I particularly like because although it is, as I've just said, ecstatic, it's also elegiac. The clown seems to be turning away from us. Uh, he's leaving the stage, but he's not leaving the stage in despair, not in a picture like this. Um, so what I want to do tonight is share with you some of my own observations after long consideration about what might characterize, characterize the later lifestyle, at least in the work of a few artists whom I can connect. Uh, in this case, we're going to focus particularly on Titian, on Matisse, and on Hopper, because I want to look at ways in which, at the end of their lives, they isolated and distilled a particular characteristic that had preoccupied them throughout their careers, and tried to drive ever deeper into that element of their art. In the case of Titian, I want to talk about pigment itself. With, color, with Matisse, of course, it'll be color. And with Hopper, it would be light. Um, in the process, I'm going to focus mostly on work done by artists after the age of 70. This is a threshold, uh, threshold age that many artists themselves have spoken about. Uh, Renoir once said that had he not lived until 70, he would have been meaningless, nothing. I don't believe that. I don't think he believed it either, but he did say that. Um, but my favorite testimony to the importance of the work you do after 70 came from the great 19th century Japanese artist and printmaker Hokusai, whose uh, work you see here, who said, all I have produced before the age of 70 is not worth taking into account. At 73, I have learned a little about the real structure of nature. When I am 80, I shall have made still more progress. At 90, I shall penetrate the mystery of things. At 100, I shall have reached a marvelous stage. And when I am 110, everything I do, be it a dot or a line, will be alive. I beg those who live as long as I to see to it that I do not keep my word. Um, Hokusai lived only to 94, although that's a pretty good run. Um, but, then, but he did indeed produce some of his most memorable images in the last decades of his life, which would include this, the giant wave off of Kanagawa. So 70 is an age at which one could say you know you might be in life's final stretch. In fact, you probably are. But when you can still possess the energy and the skill and the will to pursue and further your art. Uh, and to put it in another way, it's Mick Jagger's age. <laughs> That's the last we'll see of him tonight. Um, it's, not, it's surprising how many artists lived well beyond 70, uh, especially given that they often lived in eras when the life expectancy was a good deal shorter. Uh, Titian, whose date of birth is uncertain, was probably born between the, age, between the years 1488 and 1490, so that when he died in Venice in 1576, he would have been between 86 and 88. And that was at a time when the, age, uh, average, uh, the average Venetian male lived only until his mid-40s. For every, for every Raphael or Watteau, Van Gogh or Seurat, Modigliani or Eva Hess, all who disappeared in their 30s. There were a dozen like Michelangelo and Bernini, Degas and Monet, Helen Frankenthaler and Cy Twombly, who lived and worked well into their 80s. Um, this is Louise Nevelson's Ocean Gate, which she completed when she was 83. And when Ellsworth Kelly turned 90 earlier this year, he entered the decade that Picasso and Oscar Kokoschka, Chagall and de Kooning all lived to see, to say nothing of Louise Bourgeois and Georgia O'Keeffe, who both lived to be 98. So I'll be able to take examples tonight from the work of quite a few old timers, but as I said, I plan to focus on just a few. Let's start with Titian. Titian is an obvious place to start for a couple of reasons, and the first is that he was my personal introduction to the idea of a later style. In 1972, I took a year off from college, and I did one of those backpacking years around Europe that people did in those days, and maybe still do. Uh, my first stop was in London, and my first destination there was the National Gallery. And in the very cold, damp, miserable February of 1972, uh, the gallery was in the middle of a public campaign to raise funds to keep this painting, Titian's Death of Actaeon, in England. It had been on loan to the gallery for 10 years from the collection of the Earl of Harewood, 
but he had just sold it to the Getty Museum in the United States. Uh, the museum had succeeded in getting a delay in the export license to give it time to pursue a public campaign to raise an amount of money to match the sale price and keep it in England. Um, it's a strange painting, as you can see, sort of as gloomy as the London weather was that winter. And it's one of the last of the several poesies, the mythologized poems, mostly from Ovid, that Titian produced in the last 10 or 15 years of his life, almost all of them for, all of them actually, for the great patron of his last years, King Philip II of Spain. He started making them in 1551. Um, this one was begun about eight years later, uh, but was never delivered to Philip, as a couple of them were not. Uh, Titian worked on it repeatedly until the time of his death and could never bear to part with it uh, for reasons we'll get into later or speculate on later. Uh, the scene it depicts is an episode from the Greek poet Ovid that tells the story of Acteon, a hunter who stumbled upon the goddess Diana while she was bathing in a sacred grove with her attendants. Uh, this means that he saw her naked, a sight that was forbidden to mere mortals. And despite the fact that it was an accidental transgression, the goddess could not be placated and she devised an ingenious and instantaneous punishment. She transformed him into a stag, a deer, that's the action you're seeing on the right hand side, and he was tracked down and torn to pieces by his own hunting dogs. Um, by 1972, uh, the year I first saw this painting, I had seen a fair number of Titians in the United States, but this painting was nothing like those. Um, where were Titian's blue skies and rosy outlines? Where were the well-defined figures and uh, well-defined landscape that's more familiar from earlier Titians? Um, actually, what was going on in this picture at all was the question that I had when I first saw it. What I soon learned was that I was seeing my first example of Titian's late style. Uh, without being sure how I felt about it, and without knowing how I felt about the idea that a painting by an Italian artist made for a Spanish patron that spent over a century in a French collection before coming to England was somehow eternal British cultural property. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, nonetheless kicked in a few coins to the rescue uh, uh, fund, which was successful. And on many subsequent visits to London over the years, I've always made a point of stopping in to see this picture, uh, to see how they were taking care of my Titian. And, uh, also to see how I continued to feel about its enduring strangeness, because there's no other way to describe it. Titian is also an obvious place to begin, because uh, he was, with Donatello and Michelangelo, simply one of the first artists to present us with the idea of a late style. In his case, the style has to do mostly with brushwork, loose, open brushwork that was very unusual in the 16th century. A flurry of brushwork that blended figure and, and background, and that effectively broke the confines of European painting almost as soon as they had been locked into place. But it was more than a style, I, I think. It was really the signature of an artist who had come to a point in his life and career in which he had nothing to prove and no one to satisfy but himself. This is Titian in 1562 in a self-portrait he made when he would have been in his early 70s. By that time, he had been a hugely successful painter for almost 50 years and had become over that time really the first international art star. Even Michelangelo worked entirely in Italy. Uh, Titian had patrons and commissions all throughout, the, all throughout Europe. Um, in that time, he had completely revolutionized the art of portraiture. This is his portrait of uh, Federico Gonzaga from 1525. He had entirely reimagined painterly conventions like the enthroned Madonna. This is his really utterly revolutionary Pizarro family Madonna from 1526, where the Madonna has been taken out of the center of the picture and elevated. And along with his friend and collaborator, Giorgione, who of course had died young, uh, Titian virtually invented the long-standing, now long-standing tradition of the reclining female nude in pictures like this one, the Venus Durbino from 1538. Uh, while Titian had never entirely adopted the firmly drawn lines almost jackhammered into place that were characteristic of Florentine painting, of Michelangelo, of Raphael, and so forth. All the same, in his earlier work, as you can see here, there's still a well-defined figure, well-modeled, firmly defined backgrounds, and so forth. But in his 60s, Titian became intrigued by the possibilities of a more ocean, open brushwork. Um, a flurry of rapid marks as a signifier for life and vitality but also 
paradoxically as a signifier of anguish and anxiety. This would be an enormously influential style. This kind of whiplashing brushwork, <laughs> excuse me, whiplashing brushwork would be picked up later by Velazquez and El Greco, Rubens and Rembrandt in the 19th century by Manet, Delacroix, Turner, and then into the 20th century among the German expressionists, Oskar Kokoschka. The late style was a thunderbolt that Titian threw in late life and it traveled a long distance. Uh, at the same time, it's necessary to acknowledge that there's some controver controversy about whether the late style was deliberate. Um, many people in Titian's lifetime questioned whether what they called his patchy painting wasn't the consequence of his diminishing physical capabilities of declining uh, eyesight of a shaky hand, and whether it was simply a question that he was too old to produce the, the uh, confident finish of his earlier work. Um, this has been a controversy in art history for as long as I've been alive. Uh, and over the years, I have come down on the side that it is a deliberate style, and I have a few reasons I'd like to give you briefly. Um, <clears throat> one is that Titian began embarking on this style in his 50s, a time when no one doubted that he was still in possession of his complete physical capabilities. This is his 1945 portrait of his poet and f of his friend and great champion, the poet Aretino. Uh, Aretino complained in a letter not to Titian, but to another correspondent, that despite his love of Titian, he didn't think this was a portrait. He thought it was an oil sketch that it looked unfinished. And you can see the darting rapid brushwork all around it. Again, this is, this is 1545. Titian is only in his 50s. Um, this is another example. This is one of the earliest pictures that Titian painted for Philip. It's Adane, one of several he made, from Ovid's story of Zeus seducing a beautiful woman by, by converting himself into a shower of gold. This picture always makes me think of Donald Trump. Uh, <laughs> uh, don't tell him I said that. It's from about 1551, uh, when Titian would have been in his early 60s. And he's, always, and he's already leaving individual brush strokes, especially you can see them along the white bed linens towards the bottom, to appear as separately visible blobs and, blobs and drags of paint. Um, one other important consideration. In his old age, Titian could depend on the support, as I've said, of King Philip of Spain. And that was important because Philip was a knowledgeable patron. He was the son of uh, the Emperor Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire. Charles had been one of Titian's greatest and most devoted uh, patrons, and he passed on to his son his great love and respect for Titian as well as for art generally. So it was possible for Titian to imagine that in later life he could produce paintings for a patron who might be able to follow him down more experimental paths. And it's important to remember two things. One is that in later life, almost all of Titian's autograph paintings, autograph paintings being the ones produced largely by his own hand and not by studio assistants, almost all of those were produced for Philip. And secondly, they were in an unusual relationship in that most of the topics were chosen by Titian. Ordinarily, in a patron relationship, it's the patron who tells the artist what to do, but Philip was merely king of Spain and Titian was Titian. Um, that's important for reasons we'll see later because the storyline or the narrative of many of these paintings seems to have a relation with Titian's feelings towards the end of his life. Uh, one last point here in connection with whether the late style was deliberate, and it involves one of the most freely worked of all Titian's late canvases. This is his Pietà. From, 17, from 1575, which would be roughly the year before he died. And it was intended by him for the tomb above what he would believe would be his tomb in his uh, native village outside of Venice. Uh, neither the painting, nor for that matter Titian, made it to that tomb. And this painting today is in the Academia. Um, it was also, like the death of Actaeon, still in Titian's workshop at the time of his death. It's less surprising that he couldn't let go of it. It was for his own purposes. At his death, it was acquired for a while by his closest uh, studio assistant after his own son, Orazio, uh, Palma, di Gi Palma Giovanni. Palma acquired the painting and touched it up in a few places. He added the angel at the top and an inscription uh, explaining that he had finished or had been honored to finish what Titian had begun. Um, this is important because, in fact, in the completion, what he did, other than to add the angel, was simply touch it up in a few places. He did nothing to smooth out the very roughly indicated central figures of Christ, Mary, 
That's Mary Magdalene shouting at us from the left-hand side, and St. Jerome on the bottom. And as the man who knew Titian's intentions better than anyone, um, it's interesting that he felt that in Titian's eyes, those figures would have been complete. Um, the anguished mood of this painting, by the way, is typical of Titian in his final years. His correspondence, uh, when it's not full of complaints about money, is full of complaints about the calamities of his time, um, a terrible war with the Turks, um, the calamities of, of um, plague and pestilence was hitting uh, Venice all the time. Although uh, plague was, there was a period of plague when he died. It's not clear that Titian himself died of the plague, but we do know that his son, Orazio, died of it just a couple of days later. There were also common famines. It was a very difficult and dark time. Um, and yet, and what you can see here in this painting is one of the many self-portraits that Titian added to his pictures in these dark years of his life. That figure of St. Jerome in the red uh, robe is a plain self-portrait of Titian on his hands and knees approaching Christ whom he had every expectation and hope of seeing in person sometime very soon. And in what I think is an incredibly poignant gesture, he's literally gripping Christ's hand. Um, Self-portraits, as I said, became more common for Titian in, the, in his later work. This is the entombment uh, from 1559, a few years before the Pietà, uh, uh, 15 years before the Pietà. And already, we see Titian in a self-portrait at the left in the, uh, the mustard-colored gown, laying Christ to rest. And the bleakness of some of his late religious painting also finds its way into his mythological paintings as well. And you'll recall that I said that Titian chose the topics of those paintings. And what he increasingly settled upon as the topic was the capriciousness and injustice of the gods and their indifference to human suffering. And that would be the lesson of his most unnerving late painting, the death of the, not just the death of Acteon, but this one, the flaying of Marsyas. A chilling scene of the god Apollo serenely, skill, <laughs> serenely skinning alive a satyr who had dared to challenge him to a musical contest. In Titian's picture, the hapless Marsyas has been strung up by his hooves, a detail that Titian invented. It's not in the poem by Ovid, like a captured animal. And near the bottom of the canvas, you'll see a little dog who is delicate, delicately lapping up the satyr's blood, a perfect conjunction of the grotesque and the ordinary, and a detail that it always occurs to me could have come straight out of Auden's poem that you'll probably know, the Musée des Beaux-Arts, the one that starts uh, about suffering, they were never wrong, the old masters, and goes on, they never forgot that even the dreadful martyrdom must run its course. Anyhow, in a corner, some untidy spot where the dogs go on with their doggy life, and the torturer's horse scratches its innocent behind on a tree. Uh, we're spared the horses behind in this picture, but we do get the dog. Like the death of Acteon, this is a picture that was still in Titian's studio at his death and had apparently been worked and reworked for years as though Titian couldn't bring himself to part with it. And you have to wonder if that might not be because the subject, this is speculative, a creature tormented for his art was a subject too close to the heart of this increasingly tormented painter. It's notable that this is another picture in which Titian included a portrait of himself that's Titian as King Midas on the right-hand side with his chin cupped in his hand. Uh, Midas had uh, been one of the people asked originally to act as a judge on this contest. He had found in favor of Marsyas, but was overruled by the muses. And it's notable here also that uh, it's part of the King Midas legend that after an earlier musical contest, Apollo had mocked him by investing him with uh, the ears of an ass. And although it's not easily visible here, that is what is he, what he is wearing. So this is Titian in a self-portrait depicting himself as a king, which he was, the king of the European art world, but also as a fool. A creature suffering and also observing the torture of a creature who was suffering for his art and for his hubris as an artist, his presumption to compete with the gods, and his failure to understand that that's a game you can't win. When you look at that picture in this light, you realize something also about the death of Acteon that it too might be an allegory for the plight of the artist because, as one of Titian's biographers has pointed out, the crime for which Acteon was punished was any painter's most basic transaction with the world, the simple act of seeing. And it's here when you realize, 
excuse me, when you realize Titian's darkening mood in his later years, that his freer style begins to seem not simply a matter of the optics of painting, how you make the surface of a canvas appear, but also a way of using paint, the sticky, oily substance itself, as a correlative for feeling, not just the things it depicts, but the thing that the paint is. The flickering brushwork and the almost blistered surface effects in the Marsyas picture, which, by the way, was a painting that was signed by Titian, a strong indication that he considered it to be finished, turns the whole canvas into a kind of uniform force field, infected in every corner by the anguish and pain of its subject. The artist's hand literally carries out to that anguish, and also of the artist who made it, and finally of us, the viewers. And by the way, when I say the artist's hand, I mean that literally Palma Giovanni, that studio assistant who I mentioned a little earlier, uh, reported that in his late paintings, Titian often ap applied the pigment with his fingers and thumbs. He would go at it hammer and tong, literally needing, feeling the need to feel the pigment himself and not to use the intermediary of brush. And this brings me to my final observation about Titian's late work uh, that marks the late work of several of the other, other artists I'll discuss tonight, and that's what I call a form of essentialism, um, a final attempt to get to the very heart of some important element of their art that had preoccupied them all their lives. In Titian's case, that obsession was paint itself. Uh, as many of you will know, the Italian artists of the 1500s and late 1400s were the first generation to work with oil paint, a northern invention that came south in the 15th century. Um, oil paint was a very different medium from the thinner egg weight-based uh, mediums that had been used before, gesso and tempera. Uh, depending on how much powdered pigment you added to the oil, you could turn paint into something with a substance like soft butter and you could spread this muck, he discovered the expressive possibility of that muck. Uh, discovered that paint itself, not just the things it depicted, could be a conductor for feeling and for the emotional charge of a picture, a charge that more than 400 years later we still feel. And with this, he immensely widened the possibilities of Western painting in the same way that the early silent film directors widened the possibility of movie making when they discovered cross-cutting and many centuries before Marshall McLuhan he realized that the medium really is the message. Um, that lesson would ring down more than four centuries to this painting. Uh, this is Merritt Parkway by Willem de Kooning from 1959, an exercise in the power of pure pigment, divorced from any representational requirements at all, a final step that Titian couldn't take but might have appreciated when he saw it 400 years later. Um, at this point, I'd like to lighten up a bit <laughs> um, old age is not all about affliction and anguish. Um, it's remarkable how many artists in their last decades discover a second wind in terms of physicality, sensuality, and renewed sexual awareness, kind of like a recovered memory. Uh, I, <laughs> you can take the great Venetian painter, Giovanni Bellini, in whose workshop the young Titian apprenticed. In fact, you can see one of Bellini's last paintings, which was completed by Titian, The Feast of the Gods. It's in the National Gallery and it's on view, I was just, just looking at it again yesterday. In 1515, however, when Bellini was about 85 and just a year away from his death, he did a remarkable thing. He painted his first ever freestanding female nude, this wonderful picture, Woman with a Mirror. Then there's Angra, uh, who was 82 when he painted the Turkish bath. Um, in his case, these were not, of course, his first nudes. Um, he was famous for them. He'd been making them all his life. Uh, but interestingly, this was a canvas in which the old man reached back more than half a century. This picture is from 1862. To the memory of a woman, the one we know as the Valpisson bather, whom he had first painted when he was 28. Um, he had revisited her a number of, period, a number of times in subsequent years or it revisited her memory, if not the actual woman. And then there's the wonderful Louise Bourgeois. Um, she was 89 when she made this fabric and, steel, and stainless steel sculpture called Seven in a Bed. Um, it stems in part from her memories of childhood. As you know, memory was one of her obsessive uh, elements in her art, uh, but also from her lifelong willingness to explore physicality and sensuality, and sometimes with absolutely no limits. Um, even Ellsworth Kelly, 
whose abstract vocabulary of monochrome colored panels might not seem to offer much room for eroticism, was in his late 80s when he made this wall piece, Black Form 1, that is certainly suggestive of something. Um, I offer all of these by way of introduction to the work, uh, the late work of Auguste Renoir, who devoted a good part of his last years to painting plump, rosy nudes, young women who became more fleshy and succulent as he himself became more disabled. Uh, this is Renoir in 1912. In the 1890s, when he was still in his 50s, he developed rheumatoid arthritis. It progressed until his fingers were bent up and to claws with the tips pressed against the palm of his hands. In this picture, made when he was 73, I think you can see the extent of his disability. By 1907, on the recommendation of his doctors, he had relocated to the south of France, like so many other artists, where he found a kind of personal paradise tended by the ghosts of the Mediterranean. His particular garden was a farmstead in a town called cagnes sur mer that was not far from Nice, where one of his late life neighbors would be Matisse, who would visit him a number of times. And though in constant pain from that year, right up until his death in 1919, at the age of 78, Renoir entered one of the most productive periods of his career, producing hundreds of canvases, many of them at a time when he could barely grip a brush. But many of those canvases, especially the many, many nudes, still have a very mixed reputation. Uh, by a lot of estimates, uh, both now and at the time, Renoir went out in a blaze of kish. Um, there was something about all those pillow nudes sunning their abundant selves in dappled glades, all those peachy girls idling outdoors, all that pink. Um, in the long twilight of his career, the old man had found his way to a very a succulent classicism that modernized can find awfully hard to take and that even many of Renoir's contemporaries found simultaneously gamey and insipid. Uh, if you take one look at a painting like this one, After the Bath, which is from 1910, the problem is obvious. Um, the cupcakes don't get much more scrumptious than this. And this is another way of saying that in his later life, Renoir actually inaugurated what would become a whole future line of mildly lubricious female representation, from the phosphorescent nymphs of Maxfield Parish to Tinkerbell and even to the Playboy Bunny. Uh, all of these owe something to his very influential reworking of classical style into something that could be called softcore classicism. <laughs> and, and yet, and yet, for all that, Renoir himself was thrilled by the output of his last years. I mentioned that he once said that if he had not lived till 70, he wouldn't have been worth remembering. Uh, but, and he had one very significant fan, which is why I introduce him tonight, uh, one of the foundational figures of modernism, Picasso. I want to talk briefly about how it could be that these nudes made by an artist in old age could be so important and catalytic for a much younger and, in these years, much more revolutionary artist. Um, after the First World War, when he was finally making some real money and living in bourgeois splendor with his first wife, Olga Kolkovla, uh, Picasso actually acquired two Renoirs, which he displayed prominently in his apartment because he enjoyed shocking his bourgeois friends who already knew that you know, late Renoir was some, somewhat beyond the bounds of taste. And he would insist to them that he thought this was Renoir's most important work, not the particular painting he owned, but the, the nudes of this period. And given that so much of late Renoir appears um, saccharine and semi-comical to us, what was it that Picasso saw? Uh, chiefly this, that in pictures like this one, another of Renoir's nudes, this also from 1910, they provided Picasso with the example of a classicism that was literally timeless, by which I mean it was divorced, not only from any signifiers of modern life, this is not a nude indoors in a parlor, this is not one of Manet's nudes, reclining on a couch that's plainly from the 19th century. But it was also not placed in any obviously classical or even classicizing settings. There is no classical architecture surrounding her. She's not wearing, her, she's not casting off a toga. Renoir's aim in these pictures was to reconfigure the female nude in such a way that it would convey the elemental spirit of the classical world without resorting to any of the trappings of classicism and set, as I've said, in these timeless outdoor settings 
These women would point back to antiquity simply by their scale and their weight and their serenity and occasionally also by the recognizable classical poses that they were striking. Now as it happens, this was an ambition that resonated with Picasso strongly after the First World War. In the aftermath of the explosive dislocations of Cubism and also the explosive dislocations of the First World War, Picasso was moved to re-examine the restorative possibilities of classicism for his own art. And this, of course, was part of the general movement among European artists, the one we call the Rappel à l'autre, the return to order, to re-examine a more stable art that would be restorative and calming after the dislocations of the First World War. It's also true that during the war, Picasso had made his first trip to Rome as part of the uh, retinue of Sergei Diaghilev in the Ballet Russe. You'll remember that Picasso's wife was a dancer from the Ballet Russe. Uh, in that period, he had designed the costumes and decor for the uh, Ballet Russe's modern uh, production, Parade. And uh, in Rome, he would also have his first face-to-face -face encounter with the work of the great Renaissance artists on their own territory. He had, of course, seen their work in the Louvre. But it's different when you see it on site, as all of you will know. In later years, he liked to minimize the impact of this trip on his art, but I don't believe it. I think that it did for his art what Renoir's early, earlier trips to Rome had done for his. Renoir came back from one of his Roman trips, convinced that Impressionism was going down the wrong road. It was too uh, feathery, it was too temporary, it was too weightless, and for a long time he returned to a style, or adopted for the first time, a style of firmly drawn contours and weightier figures. Um, I believe that Picasso's first experience of Raphael and Michelangelo in Italy, in the Italian setting, also made him wonder about how the sheer weight of the Renaissance art, its classically derived figuration, could be reincorporated into his own work. This was one of his solutions, and there are several like it. There, from 1921, a couple of years after Renoir died, but years in which Picasso was meditating deeply on Renoir's last work. Uh, this is called uh, Seated Nude on a Rock. It's in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, as you may know. This is another example. Seated Nude Drying Her Feet, also from 1921. Looking at these, it's obvious how Renoir's nudes, purged of their high sugar content, uh, helped Picasso to translate classicism into his own terms, and how the work of a much younger artist, or rather a much older artist, could act as a catalyst in the mind of a much younger artist and still provide a link in art historical terms from one generation to the next. So now onto the other great master of the 20th century. This is Matisse in the 1940s uh, in bed uh, where he spent much of his time in those years as an invalid making some of the color cutouts that were his magnificent last contribution to art. He turned 70 in 1940. Uh, it was a watershed year for him in a number of ways, all of them miserable. 1940 was, of course, the year that the Germans climbed all over France. The north of France and portions of the west, of course, became German-occupied territory, including Paris. Paris was where Matisse's wife and grown children lived in a suburb of Paris. Uh, Matisse himself, since 1917, had been living almost uh, most of every year in Nice in the south. Uh, his wife would come and visit him sometimes, although less frequently as the years went by. And of course, the south of France was in hardly better shape as it became part of the puppet Vichy regime. So in political terms, uh, Matisse, who was an ardent French patriot, uh, looked, looked at the moment he was living in, remembered back to the First World War, another period of misery for him, and shuddered for the future. It was also a period, I might add, when his beloved daughter Marguerite uh, joined the French resistance. Uh, with the result that she was eventually arrested by the Gestapo, sent to a concentration camp, and tortured. Um, ordeals that she managed to survive, but uh, with no end of anguish for Matisse during most of the war years who didn't know her fate. Uh, it was a bad year for him in another reason. Um, his wife, Amélie, demanded a divorce. Uh, as I mentioned, Matisse had been living for most of each year in the south of France. Uh, but for, since, since the 1930s, or the early 30s, he had been living in particular in the company of a woman named Lydia de Lectroskaya. You'll find her in many of Matisse's paintings of this period. She was his studio assistant, his uh, helper, his muse, his model. Uh, and many Matisse scholars have also assumed that she was his lover. It's important to note that Lydia herself always fervently denied that this was the case. 
and that um, Matisse is a very good English language biographer, Hilary Sperling, has accepted uh, Lydia's denials. It's important all the same to say that uh, Matisse's family didn't accept her denials, and certainly not his wife. Uh, Lydia's family didn't, didn't even accept them. And so in 1940, uh, Matisse's wife demanded a divorce. This again was a calamity for him because in, in his way, he still loved his wife. It also meant a 50% division of property. Um, as a final blow, in that same year, Matisse was diagnosed with duodenal cancer. This would lead to two very serious surgeries over the next 12 months, surgeries that would leave him effectively disabled for the rest of his life. He could stand, he could walk a little bit, but he spent most of the day either in bed or in a wheelchair. He even had a bed equipped on wheels that could be moved around his studio without requiring him to move to his wheelchair. So his 70th year was an incredibly difficult time. He was beset by three different calamities and he considered them as such. His, uh, his correspondence of that time is full of anguished passages. And yet it's one of the things I've always loved about Matisse, that he never let any of this contaminate or infect his work. And during these years, he found his way to some of the most revolutionary and some of the most pleasure-filled work of his entire career. Uh, he, I was actually able to say at one time, only what I created after my illness, which means after 1940, after the age of 70, constitutes my real self, free and liberated. He made this leap by way of an, <clears throat> an intense and intensifying leap into another of the central obsessions of his working life, as I said before, in his case, color. With Matisse, with Titian, it had been pigment. With Matisse, it was color. In this way, the work of his last 16 years is another example of that kind of essentialism, if you will. Um, Matisse, of course, was the great colorist of the 20th century and had often spoken of his ambition to somehow find a way to work in pure color. And with the cut paper work of his last years, he had done just that. He talked about it as a way of working directly in color, of sculpting in color, of not having to draw an outline and fill it with color, but make color the instrument of the picture. Um, he actually did this first in some of the paintings that he started to produce in the late 1930s. If you know Matisse's work, you know that in the 20s, he had moved back into a kind of volumetric, perspectival, academically modeled painting like this one uh, 19, from 1924, Pianist and Checker Players. It's actually owned by the National Gallery. It is not, however, on view right now because it wasn't there yesterday. Um, <laughs> Uh, but in the mid-30s, he began to return to the decorative flatness, to the wide areas of pure color that had been coming back into his work a little bit, and that harked back to the great work of, his, uh, of the 1900s and teens, like the Red Studio, a painting I'm sure most of you know, and this one, the view of Notre Dame from 19, I believe, 14. Um, in the later, um, in the... 40s, this kind of flatness had come back into his work in an, in an important way, so that a picture seemed to be constructed once more from, as we say, decorative areas of flat color. And this kind of painting seems to, well, of course, this painting is actually from 46. He had already begun doing the cutouts at this time. But the same interest co is coincident in both the painting of his time and the cut paper. You could actually say that the origins of the cut paper go far, as far back as the dance, the famous piece, uh, actually three pieces that uh, Matisse did as a commission for the uh, Philadelphia art collector, Albert Barnes. Um, although this looks like a cut paper work, it is actually a work in oil on canvas, but it, was, it had its beginnings in Matisse's studio as cut paper. He was using cut paper in 1931 through 33 when he worked on this commission for the first time as a way of constructing a picture doing the preliminary stages, cutting paper, cutting it again, reshaping it, moving it around, having his assistants move it back and forth. But the final stage of the work at that time was still a work in oil. It was not until 1950 that he made the first cut paper work that he thought of as a complete work in itself. And that was actually just a magazine cover for a French magazine that was devoting a special issue to France at its time of national emergency. And Matisse wanted to do something for them. 
But that also began to give him the idea that cut paper itself could be the end in itself. And it wasn't until after he had endured the surgeries the next 12 months that it, he realized that although his disability might make it more difficult for him to paint, and easel painting would eventually drop out of his production entirely uh, over the years of the 1940s, it opened the way to the creation of a completely new and exciting kind of art. This is the fall of Icarus. Um, most of this work would not be published until 1946, after the war. But it was begun, a lot of it, in the war years. This is from 1943. And although the yellow bursts all around the figure of Icarus might appear to us to be stars, Matisse has said that they actually originated in, in shell blasts in the south of France. 1943 was a particularly difficult year. It was before uh, the G-Day invasion, and there was even talk of an allied bombardment of Nice. That was the year, actually, that Matisse had to uh, temporarily abandon Nice um, for the small town of Vence, which, of course, is where he would eventually decorate the famous chapel. To make these works, uh, Matisse simply had his studio assistants cover, cut, cover large sheets of paper with uh, gouache, which is opaque watercolor, in some kind of high-key palette, each sheet in a different color, cobalt, fuchsia, citric yellow. Uh, then he would cut and recut the shapes. The studio assistants would take direction from him in bed to reorganize them on the floor. Then they would pin them up on the walls, and he would reorganize them again. And it thrilled Matisse. It thrilled him to be able to do work of this kind, so that even when he made a work like this one, which is called The Sorrow of the King, it looks anything but sorrowful. Um, he described this process, as I said, as sculpting with color, which to me brings to mind again uh, Titian, as described by his assistant Palma Giovanni, literally needing to put his hands on the thing that had obsessed him all his life. In, in Titian's case, it was the pigment that he played with like muck. In Matisse's case, it's the pigment that he cut directly into. I've also felt, and this is very speculative on my part, I don't like to rely too much on psychological explanations, but after having suffered so much serious surgery, the cut paper technique might have been in some subliminal way for Matisse, a way of regaining control over the very idea of cutting, uh, to be the one who was wielding the sharp instruments. Uh, this time, instead of having them slice through him, uh, using them to produce movement and vitality instead of inability, uh, taking an instrument of pain and turning it into an instrument of pleasure, which I think of as a very Matissean thing to do. Um, and just as Matisse's obs obsession with pigment for its own sake was brought to completion by later paintings like de Kooning, Matisse's drive for color, freed from the confines of representation, was fulfilled not long after his death by artists in color field painters like Ellsworth Kelly. This is blue, green, and red, a Kelly painting from 1963. And it's obvious that to the cut paper works I don't have to point out to you. Um, one last example of later life essentialism. Uh, this one comes to us by way of, of Edward Hopper and Hopper's use of light. This is Hopper in his 70s. He turned 70 around 1952. Uh, for him, the, decades of the, the decade of the 1950s was both the best of times and the worst of times. In 1950, he had been given a very important retrospective uh, by the Whitney Museum that also traveled to Boston and uh, Detroit. Uh, the retrospective only acknowledged what everyone knew by that time, which was that Hopper was one of the most respected American painters, and one of the rare figures to be well regarded by both the older re generation of representational painters and the coming generation of abstractionists, most of whom dismissed the other representational painters, um, like Benton, as, as an old guard whose time had gone. Uh, in 1952, he had been chosen by the... Uh, uh, the United States to represent the U.S. at the Venice Biennale, along with three other American artists. In 1956, he would appear on the cover of Time, uh, a kind of coronation by the media, or at least by Henry Luce. Uh, his paintings were selling better than ever, although he and his wife Josephine still lived in an incredibly modest way, unimaginable now, especially in the, in the age of Jeff Koons and Damien Hirst. They lived in a fourth floor walk-up on the south side of Washington Square Park in Greenwich Village, 72 steps from the bottom floor to the top. And they spent their summers in a house in Truro on Cape Cod, which they had built themselves and did not bring electricity to until 20 years later in 1957. Um, that's how a famous artist would live in those days. 
Um, on the other hand, in the 1950s, it was also in some ways the worst of time for Hopper. Uh, for one thing, as I've mentioned, representation, representational artists felt themselves increasingly neglected and marginalized, so much so that they felt it necessary to form an organization. They called it reality. Hopper was a member that would try to fight back against curatorial uh, disaffection, uh, especially at the Museum of Modern Art, which they felt was uh, cutting them out entirely. Um, Hopper's long marriage, although in no danger of dissolving, was also an ever more difficult partnership. Uh, this was partly because of Hopper. He was always a very gruff and inward man and a man of few words, and by the 50s he was a man of even fewer. Um, his wife, during the preparation of the Time Magazine cover, told uh, one of our reporters that uh, talking to Eddie is sometimes like throwing a rock down a well, except it doesn't even make a plunk when it hits the bottom. <laughs> um, and I think it says something that she devoted at least part of one of the years in the 50s to reading what was then a popular book by the distinguished American psychologist Albert Ellis. It was called How to Live with a Neurotic. Um, but their, the difficulties in their marriage were also due to Josephine herself. She was a painter, uh, not, a, not nearly as successful as Hopper, and she wanted badly to find the kind of recognition, and you could even say vindication, that she sought throughout her life but never realized. She had a, what you could only call a professional jealousy in respect of her own husband. She complained to her journals, and they were voluminous, um, that he was a killer. She complained to a friend of hers that he had the smugness of success. She said in another journal entry that she couldn't bear to live with him, but she couldn't imagine living without him. And I think that summed up the marriage for both of them. Um, all the same, uh, in those years, Hopper uh, approached, uh, as he approached 70, uh, made a shift in his work. I wouldn't call it a profound change, but to borrow the words of his very knowledgeable biographer, Gail Levin, he found that sunlight in its imaginative association with light, with life rather, became more and more his real subject. And I think you can see what that means in this painting from 1953. It's called Office in a Small City. Uh, Hopper, of course, had always had a magical way of rendering light. It's one of the things we love him for. Uh, but now light had literally become more entirely what the paintings were about. Um, he does this in a number of ways. Here's another example. It's a painting called Morning Sun from 1952. That is Joe as his model. She was, by the way, his lifelong model. Um, in the paintings of his last 15 years or so, and Hopper was 84 when he died in 1967, there's notable emptying out. Um, like the later Matisse, though without resorting to actual flatness, he begins to declutter his canvases. Um, rooms tend to be less furnished. There are wide areas of bare wall that are washed with sun, as in this painting, uh, Morning Sun from 1952. His walls were widening into something like sunlit plains. And I think of these as Hopper's interiors as his equivalent for the American West. He had been out west. He had experienced western sunlight. He actually didn't like it. It was too direct and strong and wasn't like the powdery and gentler light of the Cape that he was so accustomed to. Uh, but he also understood that western light was fundamental to the history of American painting. Uh, I think of this as his American West. Um, these two pictures demonstrate another characteristic of Hopper's later work, and that is that his people are more frequently communing directly with the light, that the activity in the painting is simply people looking outward, standing or sitting, and facing towards the sun, as they do here in another painting from 1952, oh, by the way, called Sea Watchers. <clears throat> These are not the first Hopper canvases in which people look sunwards. I'm not trying to say that. I can show you examples as far back as the 20s. But pictures of this kind now make up far, a far greater proportion of his output in part because his output has by now dwindled to just one or two pictures a year. Uh, commonly, a picture of someone gazing into the light. Um, and in their almost stupefied phototropism, their rapt concentration on light, I believe these people become surrogates for Hopper himself, signifiers of his own growing fascination with light. Uh, and that was never truer than in this picture, People in the Sun from 1960, uh, this is a painting that is in the collection of the Smithsonian American Art uh, Museum and right now is in the Lou Center. Um, in, in this we find a people 
a group of people fully dressed who are sunning themselves, uh, as uh, Betsy Brun said to me today, somewhat like in a sanatorium. It made me wonder if the figure on the left is reading The Magic Mountain. Um, the, the landscape is notably, has a notable whiff of the surreal in it. This would not be the first time that Hopper has juxtaposed a building with a landscape in a strange way, but here there's almost a, a, a Magritte quality to the landscape, as though it were a false picture that the, that the figures were looking at. I think you find the same thing in this painting, Sun in the, on Brownstones from 1956, where there's an abrupt transition between the urban block and this, uh, and this rural or hillside that you see behind it. Again, this wouldn't be the first time that Hopper had done such a thing. I can show you watercolors from 1926. But this uh, surrealist element, which I'm not the first to notice, um, and which also relates him in some ways to the strange spatial juxtapositions of, of de Chirico, appears more and more frequently in work of this time. And I think it's meant to focus you instead on the light and not the narrative as the way into this picture. But especially here, in Rooms by the Sea, which is from 1951, and which may indeed have in some way been a view that it was possible to have from Hopper's studio on Truro, but I don't believe it. Um, this is a door that opens onto an impossible ocean view. I think that <laughs> Hopper wanted to capture the purest image of one element, which is the light, and to eliminate all other kinds of narrative from the picture by disrupting narrative altogether. Notably, he also eliminates people. This is one of his first, if not his first painting, in which no one appears, and he is forcing your attention on the light itself. Twelve years later, he returns to this idea in a painting called The Empty Ro Sun in an Empty Room. But this time the image takes on, I believe, an additional resonance. Um, it's a pure light machine, sunlight falling across a wall, but in such a way that it divides into two vertical rectangles. That when he was asked what this painting was about or what he was after, he gave an interesting answer. He said, it's af I'm after me. And actually, I think he was after himself and Joe. Um, this is a picture that was painted just a few years before their deaths. Hopper, I mentioned, died in 1967, and Joe one year later. And those two vertical rectangles, to my mind, inevitably call to mind tombstones. Um, I think that this is a, a reading that's validated to some extent by an earlier Hopper painting called Two Puritans, which were two vertical white houses side by side on the Cape that um, have of, often been associated as representations, symbolic representations of himself and Joe. Hopper was very tall, as you may know, over six feet tall. Joe was barely five feet. Um, though two years later, Hopper would paint a valedictory painting, his very last canvas that was called Two Comedians, a picture of himself and Joe costumed as Comedia del Arte clowns taking a final bow from a proscenium stage. And I think again of the Matisse painting that I opened up with of the clown turning away from the viewer. Um, I'm not alone in thinking that this haunting picture, uh, the best work of his last years, is his real farewell. Thanks to Albert Einstein, we know that mass and energy are two forms of the same thing and that light is a kind of transitional form between the two. And here I think that Hopper proves that light, even more than darkness, can be an appropriate means of representing the transition to death. Um, just as de Kooning could finish Titian and uh, Kelly could finish Hopper, um, rather, Kelly could finish Matisse, this is uh, a work by a later artist, James Terrell. And like works like this, I feel, are sort of the culmination of what Hopper was going after. He would have loved to, uh, Terrell's work if he had known about it. Uh, this was recently filling the entire rotunda at the Guggenheim. It only just came down. Um, all of this brings us to our final topic tonight. Briefly, I want to touch upon how artists use their late work to arrive at conclusions about late things, um, the confrontation with mortality itself. I want to start with this picture. Um, I think sometimes of uh, the last work of artists as reports on how it feels to feel the breeze from the tip of the wing of the angel of death. And this is how it felt to Goya around 1820. This is his self-portrait with Dr. Arieta, 
Uh, some years before this was painted, Goya had had a very serious illness. He did recover and lived for at least another eight years, I believe it was. Um, more than eight. Um, but uh, at the time, he was near death. We don't know what the illness was from. It's never been established firmly. But this is one of the most harrowing depictions I know of human frailty, and more than that, the frailty of the artist himself. Goya shows himself alive, but just barely. Uh, and helpless, propped up by his doctor friend who is ministering to him with this almost sacramental cup of medicine. Um, the dim figures in the background watch. They might be waiting for Goya's soul to pass over. We're not sure who they are. And the words at the bottom of the canvas, which Goya made as a gift for his doctor, and it was in the doctor's household for many years, says, Goya gives thanks to his friend Arieta for the expert care with which he saved his life from an acute and dangerous illness which he suffered at the close of the year 1819, when he was 73 years old. Um, this painting is a tribute to the power of medicine, uh, which is something new for Goya, because in some of his earlier etchings, he had treated doctors as quacks and witch doctors. It's also full of obvious religious cues, not just that sacramental cup of medicine, but in some ways it's a pieta. The doctor cradles the collapsing Goya, just as Mary cradled Christ. And I think that's important because just as after Christ's death, there was his resurrection, uh, so with Goya, we know that he recovered from this illness. And more than that, you can see his recovery prefigured in aspects of the painting. The, the green of both the doctor's coat and Goya's jacket is a kind of uh, spring renewal green. There are hints of a healthy complexion in the red of the, of the um, bed linen. And the way that Goya grips that uh, bed cover is not only a desperate gesture, but also a gesture of a man clawing his way faintly back to life. So this is not a portrait of despair. It's a portrait of hope and what I think of as anguish recollected in tranquility. Um, so that's one way to go. This is another way, anguish without the tranquility. <laughs> um, that's how Picasso went. Um, this is his famous self-portrait from 1972. Uh, the year before he died, at the age of 92, and a drawing by, that's presumed by many people to be the last self-portrait by a man who had made many, but nothing like this. Um, the left-hand side of his uh, head has no firm contours. It's dissolving into the background. Um, this, of course, is a very standard cubist mechanism, but in the context of a man who is disappearing from life, I think it carries a different resonance. Um, the, the eye that we see on the left-hand side, the man's right eye but our, on our left, is dilated and gigantic and appears to be staring outward as though trying to hold a last sight from the world. Um, the eye on the left is inward as though departing on a journey that he doesn't know exactly where it's headed. Uh, the eyes are also important to me and to many other observers because they hark back to the giant eyes of much earlier Picassos like his one of his earliest self-portraits, Yo Picasso, that you may know. And also even to the figures in Les Demoiselles d'Avignon with their giant saucer eyes. Um, this is, to me, a portrait of a man who is about to take a journey that we can't go on with him. Um, so is there any more upbeat way of facing the end? Well, there's this. <laughs> uh, this is Alice Neal's absolutely fearless self-portrait. Uh, from 1980, although it was begun in 1975. Uh, she returned to it on the recommendation of her son and finished it some years later. Uh, this is also in the collection of the Smithsonian uh, Portrait Gallery, and it is uh, on view there because I saw it again today. Um, Neil had throughout her life painted many nudes, but this is her first nude self-portrait. And to put it mildly, she depicts herself without idealization. Uh, she said she wanted to wait to make a nude self-portrait until it would be clearly an act of humility. But that's what I admire about this picture. Uh, she simply asks of herself the same unsentimental candor that she required of Andy Warhol when she made her completely matter-of-fact and fearless portrait of him in 1970 displaying the surgical scars that were a consequence of the shooting he had suffered two years earlier at the hands of Valerie Solanas. Uh, with Neil, despite her downturned mouth, I believe that this is, like Goya's self-portrait with his doctor, a picture of insistent life. You can see it in the floor, divided between the zones of citric orange and, again, that spring renewal green, and in her rosy complexion, the color of the blanket in Goya's painting. 
Uh, but you can see it best, I think, in the brush that she holds in her right hand, which she wields like a magic wand. It's the instrument of her mastery of life and her continuing control. Uh, but at the same time, I think the realism of the painting is pointed up by the white cloth that she holds in her left hand, and which I've always suspected has a symbolic intention. It's the kind of cloth that artists use to clean their brushes and to wipe away paint from a canvas. And the implication here, I think it's clear, is that a few years from now, that brush will be cleaned for the last time, and more than just paint will be wiped away. So to conclude, <laughs> words that people always like to hear from lecturers, uh, what can we learn about certain artists, or from certain artists, about dealing with the approach of death? Uh, what we learn is that you can go like Titian, or like Picasso, or you can go like Alice Neal, or you can go like Hopper, and that I don't know about you, but when my own time comes, I'm going to make every effort to go like the last two. Thank you. Good night. Light from both sides, that was not a deliberate effect. <laughs> but I like it, I like it, it's good. Um, I, I'm instructed that, uh, and it's my pleasure to take questions if there are any. Um, if I can uh, clarify any points that I made or if anyone would like to dispute them, um, I'm happy to do either. Yes. I think that Dorothea Tanning was a better artist than Joe Hopper. I think that's the problem. There have been many uh, married couples in which they're both, both members were painters. Um, Max and Paul, in his life. Uh, but in those cases, I mean, Joan Mitchell and Robert Motherwell, who were married for a time, those were both two considerable artists. And when, when Joan Mitchell and Robert Motherwell split up, they both went on to careers just as important as the ones you would expect them to have. I think Dorothea Tanning, uh, she was not nearly as well recognized, we know, as Max Ernst, but she still had managed to have a foot in the canon with her sort of semi-surrealist work with, in particular, uh, semi-surrealist work. Uh, jo Josephine Hopper, I've not seen much of her work. I've seen work in reproduction, and I always refuse to comment on anything that I haven't seen in the room. I have seen some of her paintings. Not many of them survive, and the reason for that is that uh, Jo left her, uh, a great deal of Hopper's work, as you know, to the Whitney, but also a great deal of her own work, about 100 canvases and works on paper. Uh, the Whitney gave four of them uh, to uh, NYU, uh, which owned the building that the Hoppers lived in at the end of their lives. The other 96 they distributed among New York area hospitals, and all 96 of them have been lost. Um, you can see some of them in reproduction. And uh, what I would say is that uh, Josephine Hopper was a competent painter, but she wasn't being ignored because of her husband. It's just not a case of that. Um, anyone else? Uh, please, in that way. Uh, well, oh, are there other artists that I could have spoken about tonight? Oh my God, I'll, I'll email you the parts of this lecture that I... <laughs> the Smithsonian very wisely asked me to stay roughly within a one hour time frame, which I agree with. I've been to lectures that went on for two hours, and I, I'm sorry I was there. Um, Monet, you can talk about. J.M.W. Turner, although light was an obsession of his all his, work, all his life, I could show you a succession of three paintings of the same castle, each of them dissolving over a period of years into more and more of a soup of pure light until you can barely see anything palpable in the final picture. Um, uh, I was thinking of constructing a section around Louise Bourgeois, an artist that I particularly love. And in her case, the fundamental would have been memory. But in Bourgeois' case, there's no detailed English language biography that I know of. And without that, I was reluctant to ascribe intentions to her that I couldn't feel confident when I wasn't just creating out of whole cloth. Uh, but I'd love to look more into that because I think there might be something there. Um, uh, oh, God, I'm going to see, uh, tomorrow I'm leaving for San Francisco to see David Hockney. 
uh, the David Hackney Landscape Show that's in San Francisco, all of the landscapes that he started doing only in the last 10 years. I went out to Yorkshire uh, a few years ago to meet with him and go to some of the places he's been painting. He's now 75 years old, so he's crossed my 70-year threshold. Um, and in his case, it's interesting because uh, Hackney was always very experimental in every genre that he visited, portraiture, landscape, so on and so forth. So, um, in the work of more recent years, he seems to have been going back to the great traditions of English landscape painting. He still brings some technological innovation to it. He's using uh, computer programs to link many uh, canvases all done outdoors, but into a single vast canvas that would be too large to tote around in. So he's painting in plein air, but producing monumental sized canvases of the kind that David used to produce as giant historical canvases. I have, I've seen some of that work. I have seen the rest of it only in reproduction, so again, I have no feelings about it until I see it. But I think he might be another good example. Um, yes. <laughs> Since I hit 60? <laughs> Uh, well, I, I hope it hasn't become more pompous. <laughs> there's, a, there's definitely a need to crowd more stuff in uh, that I need to tell everybody about before I go. Not that I'm, go not that I'm going anywhere. Um, I, I'm, not sure, I, I'm not sure how else I... Um, being the law writer for a couple of years while waiting for Robert Hughes to retire, um, <laughs> it made me more uh, sensitive to the need for evidence for statements that you make and not to indulge in lyrical flights of fancy. So I tried to identify tonight when I felt I was on purely speculative ground. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think it's one of the virtues of having a critic as well as an art historian and an artist take part in these um, uh, lectures, lectures because art historians will be much more sensitive to evidence. Critics get to be pie in the sky. And it's expected of us to some extent, but I tried not to take to waste your time with nothing but weightless suppositions. Uh, yes, please. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I will tell you what the, um, Sir Kenneth Clark said about Michelangelo, who's particularly interested in the two very late murals that he did of the um, crucifixion of St. Peter and the uh, conversion of St. Paul. Um, most people don't even know these, these pictures. They're, they're, not, they're widely available in reproduction. Um, but he felt strongly that they represented an almost hopelessness about history in the, uh, in the crucifixion of St. Peter. St. Peter, of course, has been crucified upside down. That's simply part of the story. Um, but the figures around St. Peter are in a circular march that, to uh, Kenneth Clark's eye, was a sign of a feeling of hopelessness about history generally and its repetitions. Um, and as we all know, uh, Michelangelo represented himself as a flayed skin in the, uh, in, in the Last Judgment, uh, which is certainly not a sign of a really upbeat, uh, you know, frame of mind. Um, yeah. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. I, and that's not out of the question. <laughs> I, guess, I guess what I would say is, um, d did, did whatever Matisse's relationship with Lydia de la Torskaya, uh, did that actually renew his painting? Uh, his, did it give him a new lease on life, if you will? Um, I, I, think it, I think it may have. Uh, of course, we have the problem that Lydia denies that there was an adulterous relationship. Matisse was notably silent on the question. Um, but many scholars, Jack Flam, who you may know is one of the most notable American Matisse scholars, think it's indisputable that there was an involvement there and that it was, in, excuse me, it was rejuvenated from Matisse. And we know with Picasso, he married late in life after a succession of relationships. Um, he only had two wives, uh, Olga, who we were married to, even after he had no longer, even long after they had split. And then after his death, he finally married again to the woman that he was married to at the very end of his life. Um, but that can't have hurt. Um, anyone else? Oh, um, I, I, let me take this person here first. Uh, there was someone back there? Oh, I'm sorry, this person over here? Yes. 
Yeah, you know, I was wondering if people had, would think I had passed over her in silence. Uh, what I would say is I'm not, I don't think the work of her last 25 years is as strong as the work of her younger days, and I have a number of reasons for feeling that way. Of course, in the very last years of her life, you know that her eyesight was such that she could barely work at all. But I actually feel that she was a great genius at the beginning. I mean, she's really America's claim to credibility in the invention of abstraction. She was out there almost the same time as Kandinsky and Malievich in inventing abstraction. Those paintings are remarkable, the ones that were in the Whitney show only a few years ago. I love the work that she does in New York when she comes up to New York and Lake George. But really, when she moves permanently to the Southwest, my interest in her work actually starts to fall off. I know that that's some of the most beloved work that she did, but that folkloric element that, that comes into it more, more prominently, I think is a betrayal of her earlier commitment to a more abstract kind of work, and it's just not to my taste. So that when we get to the later work, the later work that I like the best are the many times that she returns to abstraction in work that actually almost repeats some of the very earliest paintings. I didn't have, uh, I thought of going into her work here, but I didn't, again, there was a question of time, and I just didn't feel that I could take the time for someone whose work at the end of their life, no matter what my enthusiasm for their earlier stages, just wasn't as great. Uh, please, the woman in the booth. Well, uh, says, believe me, Cezanne only, he was on the cutting room floor. Uh, it really is a question of time. Uh, Cezanne's late, late work is some of his most important, and it's, he's one of the best examples of a late style. Uh, but since I was already working with Renoir, and I had already had to put Monet aside, uh, uh, Cezanne went, yeah, went with it. Uh, yes, please. You know, I, just, I, I didn't give that as much thought. I actually wrote about photography initially at time because Robert Hughes wasn't very interested. I won't say he wasn't very interested in it, but not interested enough to want to write about it. Um, and of course, I, I did think briefly about cartier Bresson and Cortege, uh, Robert Frank, who, we just, uh, who my magazine just sent photographers to as an honor as he's in his 80s and still working. Um, and of course, Frank's work in his late, in his last years has become is very, well, it has been actually since the 1980s, is very different from the street photography that he was doing and has taken a tremendous turn towards pessimism, frankly. But you know, some of it's related to the fact that his daughter was killed in a plane crash. He's had a number of family tragedies and he was always susceptible to depressions as well. Um, uh, yes, I, I could say that there are photographers whose work changed a lot. Uh, Cortez started to make much more, I don't want to call them brittle, but they really feel more modern. The work that he did in New York when he moved to the high apartment over uh, in uh, Washington Square, there's less of that romantic feel than there was in the work that he did in Hungary and France before he came to the United States. But that's a consequence also of coming to the US. And just as Hopper's work becomes, starts to clear out those last paintings, Cortez's work does so in the same way, I think, sometimes, although the compositions are, are just as intricate. Uh, Life magazine famously refused to hire Cortez because they told him that his, his pictures talked too much, which I think was the ultimate compliment. It simply meant that they were so intricate as compositions that the reader of Life magazine couldn't grasp them all at one time. Um, I think he I kept doing that right to the end of his life. There's this wonderful picture in Central Park of a, of a, of a boy running across uh, the road in the park so that there's an upside, there's a, a puddle with an upside down reflection of a toy ship, which as we know, Cortez was a, an emigre to the United States and I think it was an expression of his yearning and his feeling of disruption in his life as an emigre coming to the US, this ship upside down. Um, so he never lost that complexity in his pictures, but at the same time there is sort of a, an emptying out of the images in some ways. I don't know if that's a characteristic of older age generally. I looked into some of the psychology of old age, but then I decided I'm not a psychologist. You don't need to hear what I have to say about it. Thank you. Um, is, there any, is that it? That can be it, by the way. All right, one last one. This will be the last, please. Uh, yes. Funny you should ask. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. I, I, I'm very grateful to uh, the people from the Smithsonian who came to me with this request six months ago because I had been thinking about this for a long time, but obviously this is not a Time Magazine article. Um, I had gone to the wonderful late Titian show at the Academia 
in, uh, in Venice in 2007 or 8, and I had started thinking again about Laetitia at that time. Um, uh, I have been asked by a publisher if I would be interested in turning it into a proposal, but that doesn't mean it will become a book because I don't want this to be a coffee table book. I think it needs to be a regular book, but it would still need a lot of color illustrations, and I'm told that to boost the cost of production to levels that would make it impossible to sell the book. So, uh, yeah, I would love to work on this as a topic. It's, a, it's, a lot, it's very interesting to me. I hope it was interesting to you, but we'll see what happens. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Join us in the um, courtyard for a reception. Thank you for coming.